Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. All right, folks, it is time for another episode, edition, <laughs> whatever, of Grim Leftovers. I am Grimnir, your host of this evening's show. And uh, I'm glad to have you all here with us t- tonight. Yeah, we're out there all over the place in the various places you may want to check out, uh, wherever uh, those may be, whether it's right there on reallibertymedia.com or whether it's on the rlmradio.xyz page, freedomsnetwork.com, realliberty.org, internet radio, tunein.com, shoutcast, oh, Spreaker. Yeah, we're live on Spreaker too. So we're all over the place. It is Monday, February 25th, 2019. And yes, we are live at this moment. If you're listening to it at this point in time, if you're listening to it later, well, if it's new to you, it's still new show. (laughs) Oh, anyway, I hope you've all had a good week uh, and you're ready for uh, this whole new week that's coming your way. I know you're one day into it already if you're uh, one of the working stiffs. Because Monday's over with. It's the end of Monday, or, well, the end of the Monday workday for most folk that work that, uh, that, that schedule. Right? <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, so uh, we might as well just go ahead and get on to the stories. I don't really have too much uh, news about the RLM for this week. Uh, things, you know, were a little hectic there for a bit, but I think they've all calmed down now in Real Liberty Media, and uh, I'm glad. I, I, I don't I don't like all that drama crap, and I don't need it. I don't want it, and uh, so it's good that it's all come and gone for the most part. There may still be a few burrs under the saddle, but those will get combed out in time uh, <laughs> with any luck. Oh, anyway, let me say hi and howdy to all the folks over here in the Real Liberty Media chat on irc.freenode.net. Yeah, if, you, if, you, if you're not an IRCer, you can find the chat there on the reallibertymedia.com homepage. There's a little button there that says pop-up chat. You can use that. Or uh, you can go to the channels page there, and, and, and if you have your own IRC client, click on the use your local IRC client, and you'll jump right into the page here, or the, the channel here. And... Uh, and you'll see all these great folks that are here today. We got the barman. He's he's a, he's he's my, my bot, and cowboy tech, and myself, and the moose girl, uh, Mister Anti, and as Mo, uh, Chalcedony, and Circle probably asleep, but uh, you know we are guys always gonna say hi to Circle. She's awesome. Uh, we got I B Don C times two. Uh, we got Mister Meisterbrow, Mister Woodman, uh, Miss Kate, the awesome Miss Kate. Uh, we got uh, Rain and, and the Fluke bot. Yes, Miss Fluke. Yes, she's officially a female bot at this point in time. Uh, so Miss Fluke, uh, who compliments Mr. Barman. All right, we got Rob Works and Rome's in the Phantom. And well then, has joined us as well, uh, Mr. Beetle. Uh, <laughs> Kate says she's got scissors for those hard-to-reach burrs. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I, I like those scissors. Those are good scissors. Uh, we got the Cyborg Noodle. We got uh, Dakota and Frumpy and Graham Z. We got JJ's under a guest name. Yes, indeed. We got the Java Doctor and Kozu and Kiss. Uh, one of our, our, our newer participants from another channel here on IRC. And we got Ninson Dubois, the Pone Sauce, the Sock Puppet, the Tech Man. And Uno, who's a bot that plays Uno, or that helps you play Uno, I suppose. Um, I, I don't know. I don't play Uno. So, for whatever it's worth. Anyway, let's kick it off. Let's, get, let's go. Let's let's get this stuff in the gear. <laughs> hey, Cowboy Tech. Yeah. All right. So, this first article we have uh, is from a, a, a website called What's Up With That? But it's spelled W-A-T-T-S, as in watts of electricity what's up with that and this is from january 24th by anthony watts himself uh the first detection of climate change on another planet 
<laughs> wait, wait a minute. Are they driving SUVs on that planet? Oh, you got cows farting on that other planet? Yeah, I don't think so. Not so much. Satellite data reveals Venus is going through a change in its atmosphere. And the driver seems to be... Wait, stop. Let me scratch my head here. The driver seems to be... The sun. <laughs> Imagine that. That huge fireball that you see up there in the sky every day. Yeah, that's that's what actually causes global warming. The sun. Huh. Anyway. <laughs> From the Institute of Space and Aeronautical Science, ISAS, part of Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, the JAXA, comes this intriguing bit of research using data from the Atka, what? Atkasuki? Atkasuki satellite. You know, when I read these, I'm reading them to myself. I don't really need to pronounce them all that well. I, I could just kind of breeze past them. But when I actually have to actually say it, then it becomes something that my tongue has, has problems with. The Atkasuki may have discovered why Venus atmosphere rotates so fast. The reason may play out pivotal role or a vital role in the habitality habit <laughs> habitability <laughs> habitability of earth-sized exoplanets as a planet nearly the same size as earth earth and same mass as earth uh, venus is essentially an essential study for the understanding of a range of possible conditions on rocky planets. A defining feature of our neighboring world is a thick atmosphere whose reflective properties enticed ancient astronomers to name the planet after the mythological goddess of beauty, but whose ability to trap heat renders the surface temperature capable of melting lead. Yet, perhaps the strangest feature of the Venusian atmosphere is its speed. Winds whip around the planet at up to 60 times faster than the surface rotates, a phenomenon known as atmospheric super-rotation. Exceeding 100 miles per second. You got some wind down where you're at? Yeah, not quite like that, huh? 100 miles per second, uh, 360 kilometers per hour. Uh, in the upper clouds, the wind speeds on Venus are legitimately fast. However, the surface of the planet also rotates extremely slow. The planet orbits the sun in 225 days, uh, but the Earth takes another another 243 days to rotate. Uh, but it takes 243 days to rotate on its axis. What? That, that's written very weirdly. Anyway, making the Venusian day one complete rotation longer than its year. Strange, huh? One day is one year there. Anyway, such slow rotation may be common, uh, a common feature among Earth-sized exoplanets, such as the TRAPPIST-1 system of uh, Proxima Centauri b, whose close orbits to their star have likely resulted in tidal lock. Like the moon orbiting the Earth, a tidal locked world rotates once per orbit so that one side permanently faces the star while the other experiences perpetual night. Slow ro rotators with Earth-like atmospheres need to transport heat efficiently around the planet or risk the atmosphere collapsing as it freezes on the cold side of the world. Such catastrophic end could be avoided if a tidally locked world typically had the fast winds of a super-rotating atmosphere. So what causes Venus's super rotation? And it might be a might it be a common phenomenon. Classically, there are two main pictures for the super rotation. In the first scenario, frictional drag of the atmosphere over the planet's surface results in slowing down the planet's rotation to accelerate the winds. In the second scenario, the winds are excited due to heating from the sun, known as solar thermal tides. Anyway, models of the first surface-up mechanism are notoriously sensitive to the exact starting conditions of the planet. Modest shifts in the temperature uh, distribution of the planet may kill or initiate super-rotation. 
This would suggest that relatively few slowly rotating worlds would end up with atmosphere preserving super rotating winds as conditions on the planet would need to be absolutely correct. But super rotation on Venus has been observed uh, both at the, the cloud tops and down to the depths of ten, tens of kilometers. Given that Venus reflects a large fraction of the incident sunlight, could be the influence of the sun, r could the influence of the sun really be driving the super rotation of the middle layers? The Atsasuki, ah, 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 <laughs> there's that dang word again, Aka Akatsuki spacecraft, uh, meaning dawn in Japanese, uh, entered Venus's orbit on 7th of December 2015. It was on the third anniversary of the orbit uh, insertion that a press conference was held in Tokyo to discuss the latest results. Led by international top young fellow, JAXA's prestigious postdoctoral fellowship program, Dr. Javier Peralta, he don't sound Japanese at all. Anyway, <laughs> the press conference pre presented results from a new paper uh, published in the Ast Astrophysical Journal Supplemental Series in December. In this paper, Peralta used 466 images of Venusian clouds captured by the IR2 camera on the Akatsuki at a at infrared wavelength of 2.26 microns between March and November 2016. By comparing images taken at different times, Peralta was able to track clouds as they swept around the Venusian globe to measure their speed. On the Venusian day side, the atmosphere is illuminated by both or by incoming sunlight. This is uh, strongly reflected in both ultraviolet and infrared wavelengths by the upper cloud at an altitude of 60 to 70 kilometers above the planet's surface. However, the night side illumination comes from infrared heat emanating from Venus's hot surface. This is partially blocked by clouds deeper in the atmosphere at altitudes between 40 and 60 kilometers. As the clouds have varying transparency to this infrared glow, their shapes become visible when viewed through Akatsuki's IR2 camera. It was these deeper nightside clouds that Peralta tracked. Peralta's cloud tracking algorithm was semi-automatic using both humans and computers. Clouds were identified by hand and then mapped at a later, uh, at a later image using computer code and the result confirmed by hand once again. The result was 2,947 wind measurements, which revealed an interesting pattern. There was a clear acceleration of clouds that was tied to the location of the sun, strongly implying that the sun, not SUVs, was having an effect on the clouds far below the upper atmosphere. At lower latitudes, this acceleration was predominantly zonal, uh, wrapping westward around the planet, with no meridional north-south uh, wind acceleration detected. This also pointed to sun-driven system, as the surface-up mechanism should have led uh, to winds in both directions. However, Peralta was cautious when he insisted this was not case-closed. As the global warming psychos tell you, science is finished on that. <laughs> If solar tides drive the super-rotating winds, uh, th this may imply that the cloud albedo, the reflectiveness thereof, may have changed over time and affected the impact of the solar radiation. Such uh, a result is good news for tidally locked worlds. If Venus's super-rotating winds can be driven by the sun, then maybe such rapid circulation could be common on slow-rotating but potentially more temperate worlds around other stars. While the weather beneath the super-rotating atmosphere would be very different from that on Earth, it might allow the planet to retain its atmosphere and even the desired conditions for life. By comparing the two Earth-sized planets in our own solar system, we may, we, we may learn much more about what it takes to have a habitable world. Anyway, that, that's what it comes down to, is what's causing global warming, if it's even occurring, which uh, I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it. Uh, there's been a, what they, what they cause, I call a pause 
in global warming for over 20 years now. Uh, they, they started off getting all excited about their global warming. And then when they realized, when they tried to release all their global warming numbers, that the global warming had disappeared, uh, they went ahead and manipulated the numbers to make you think, to make you believe that yes, there was global warming. And not only that there was global warming, but that it was being caused by you. Yes, you, you humans, you dirty, filthy humans, and your dirty, filthy habits are causing the planet to, to go into superheating. Yeah, NASA farts, right? Um, <laughs> and well then, uh, so uh, yeah, th that's, uh, <laughs> anyway, so uh, when, 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 when someone, one of these global warming loonies or climate change loonies, alarmists, whatever you want to call them, uh, starts trying to uh, beat you down about driving whatever vehicle it is you drive or what airplanes you ride on or if you got cows in there farting. Um, uh, maybe you want to point out to them Venus in this particular article uh, showing that, yeah, yeah, global warming or climate change is not limited to Earth. So unless they have cows or SUVs on other planets, shut the hell up. <laughs> seriously <laughs> climate change is a natural phenomenon it's happened throughout the entire history of this planet and i imagine on other planets as well i haven't been to other planets not in this lifetime uh but you know um it, it uh, makes more logical sense to me that the sun, the rotation of the planet, the changes in the in the rotation of the, or the uh, orbit of the planet around the sun uh, would be much more of a cause of uh, uh, to cause the effect of climate change and or warming or cooling. Because if you remember in the early 70s, it wasn't warming. It was global cooling. We were coming into an ice age. Everybody freak out. Yeah, uh, then they decided, well, that's not really going to fly either. Because, oh, look, it's uh, like half a quarter of a degree warmer than it was the year before. So maybe not uh, Ice Age. Maybe we're, we're going to burn up and it's all because of you. And I, I don't know how they could really blame global cooling on you. But, you know, they, they always find a way. The, them and their lies. <laughs> All right, now we're on to a Wired.com story. Uh, this from their science section on January 24th of this year. Something you all know, but I'm going to report on it anyway. Pesticides are harming bees in literally every way possible. And they ain't no good for you either, by the way. Although this article focuses on the bees. The story originally reappear, re, uh, appeared on Reveal, not reappeared on Avil, uh, uh, appeared on Reveal, which is a, a website, revealnews.org. Uh, anyway, and as part of the Climate Desk Collaboration, it was produced in collaboration with the Food and Environment Reporting Network, an independent non-profit organization. While soybean farmers watched the drift-prone weed killer dicamba Ravage millions of acres of crops over the last years, couple years. Arkansas beekeeper Richard Coy noticed a parallel disaster unfolding among the weeds near those fields. When Coy spotted the withering weeds, he realized why hives that produce a hundred pounds of honey three summers ago were now managing barely half of that. Decomba probably had destroyed his bees' food. Where'd it, where'd it go? Oh, in October, the EPA extended its approval of the weed killer for use on genetically modified soybeans and cotton, mostly in the South and Midwest, for two years more. At the time, the EPA said, we expect there will be no adverse impact to bees or other pollinators. Really? Based on what? Nothing. <laughs> but scientists warned the EPA years ago that dicamba would drift off fields and kill weeds that are vital to honeybees. 
the consequences of the EPA's decisions are now rippling through the food system. Dicamba already destroyed millions of dollars worth of non-genetically modified soybeans and specialty crops, but they don't care about those. They only care about the GMO ones that, that are uh, profits for them via Monsanto. Anyway, such as tomatoes and wine grapes. And now it appears to be a major factor in large financial losses for the beekeepers, which again, they, they really don't care about the beekeepers either. Um, Hive losses don't uh, don't affect just the nation's honey supply. Honeybees pollinate more than $15 billion worth of fruits, nuts, and vegetables per year, uh, largely in California, according to the Department of Agriculture. It seems like everybody's been affected, said Brett Addy, 80, I don't know, ADE, uh, whose family runs the nation's largest beekeeping outfit in South Dakota. He thinks 2018 might be the smallest crop in the history for the United States for honey production. So expect your honey prices to start rising sharply. Um, and uh, by the way, uh, you might want to stock up on some of that and try and get as local as honey as you can. And if it's raw, all the better. You want your, you want your honey raw. It's a, it's, a, it's a much healthier food source for you. And, and honey is indeed a super food. Anyway, from 2016 to 2017, U.S. honey production dropped 9%. Official t t statistics for 2018 have not yet been released. Uh, beekeepers long have struggled to protect their hives from parasites, viruses, insecticides, and other colony-destroying threats. All these factors, as well as climate change, <laughs> right, uh, have been linked to colony collapse disorder. Oh, they got to put that climate change in there, especially wired. They're they're a major clap outlet. Uh, although, by the way, anybody unfamiliar with the term clap, it's corporate labass propaganda. Most people call it the mainstream media, but no, it's it's not mainstream and it's not media. It is pure propaganda produced by the corporations of the world and pass it out there as mainstream, and it's lame, lame. Anyway, um, which emerged more than a decade ago and destroyed 30 to 90% of some beekeepers' hives. Now with Decomba, beekeepers must contend with a scourge that can wipe out the food and habitat that bees need to thrive. Nine years ago, agricultural ecologist Dr. Uh, Oh, I don't know if he's a doctor or not. David Mortensen had told the EPA officials that allowing dicamba use on genetically modified crops would pose serious risks to wild plants and pollinators they sustain. In 2011, EPA's own scientists cited Mortensen's work to conclude that the increased use of dicamba would affect pollinators. But you heard me say earlier there in the article that the EPA themselves said, Ah, we don't expect any problem from that, even though they'd been told absolutely by their own scientists that it definitely would. But the agency registered dicamba in 2016, uh, despite the warnings, reveal from the uh, Center for... Where I lost my spot there. <laughs> where, where did that go? I don't know. I lost my spot. <laughs> Oh, I don't know, but you get the idea. Oh, there it is. Reveal from the Center for Investigative Reporting and uh, Food and Environmental. Well, thank you for that, Kate. Um, uh, <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's distracting. Reveal from the Center for Investigative Reporting and the Food and Environment Reporting Network reported in November. Last fall, the agency extended the approval through 2020. Because, you know, fuck them. Uh, people that are raising bees, they don't care nothing about them. Anyway, they got pretty damning evidence here. Uh, no one factor can explain what's driving the hive losses, but the evidence is pretty damning that dicamba affects both pollinator forage and the bees themselves. According to Mortensen, chairman of the University of New Hampshire's Department of Agriculture, Nutrition and Food Systems. Dicamba damaged nearly 5 million acres of soybeans in the, in the Midwest over the past two years. 
and you know that all the, the field edges anywhere near the damaged crops would be hammered by the herbicide, which would mean the broadleaf plants that the bees uh, go to were hammered. Dicamba has little effect on grasses, including corn and wheat, but even tiny doses can injure soybeans, wildflowers, and other broadleaf plants, such as marijuana or hemp. Well, they don't mention that here. I, I just threw that in. <laughs> here, I'll let you read the rest of this for yourself. It goes on for quite a bit. But, uh, yeah, uh, if you want to trust the EPA to uh, protect protect your plants or whatever, too bad, so sad, they ain't gonna. Yeah, they're not gonna. As a matter of fact, they only got to do what those people that are on their payroll, telling them what to do. They're on their payroll, but they're also funding them. Uh, they, they, they're, they're the ones that are in charge of these type of things. Sock Puppet says, if you linked me those from, if you linked me from those, I'd think the aliens got to you. Say, what? If you linked me from those, I'd think the aliens got to you. Linked you from those? I, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. But I got some alien stuff for you coming up later on. <laughs> how, how about this? It's not quite alien stuff, but it's kind of getting close. <laughs> from Forbes.com. <laughs> A real world. Star Trek Replicator is now possible thanks to a new breakthrough. This, I said, as on on Forbes.com, posted by Eric Mack on March 9th of last year. So almost a year old article. Uh, and, 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 what, what is this stupid video popping up? Get the hell out of my way. A replicator. Couldn't we all use a replicator at home? Wouldn't a replicator be awesome? Anyway, a startup with alumni from MIT and Yale says it's made a breakthrough in creating next generation material that should make it possible to 3D print literally anything out of thin air. Anything. Yeah, the chemtrails are certainly beating the bees to death too. And they're not really helping you either. <laughs> no, no, they're doing serious damage to all. Um, <laughs> and Rome's brings up a, a good point about the uh, the X Files and the bees and the uh, how the bees were going to be used uh, to 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 inject a certain thing into humans that would uh, turn them into hybrid aliens. Speaking of aliens, <laughs> again. So anyway, three D print anything out of midair. New York based Matter Shift has managed to create large-scale carbon nanotube membranes, CNTs, uh, that are able to combine and separate individual molecules. That's getting down there. Now, when they get to atoms, then we'll really have something. But this is at mole molecular level. Uh, this technology gives us a level of control over the material world that we've never had before, said Mattershift founder and CEO Dr. Rob McGinnis in a release. For example... Right now, we are working to remove CO2 from the air. Why are you doing that? The air needs CO2. Anyway, they're working to remove CO2 from the air and turn it into fuels. This has already been done using conventional technology, but it's too expensive to be practical. Our tech, using our tech, I think we'll be able to produce carbon zero gasoline, diesel, and jet fuels that are cheaper than fossil fuels. Well, there you have it. Oh, what disconnected me? I've been disconnected from Freenode. I don't like that. Anyway, um, <laughs> it does that to me from time to time. Anyway, CNTs have, have been identified as holding promise for a number of potential applications. From better golf clubs, really? Fuels and medicines uh, to, far, to far out concepts like space elevators. Space elevators, wow. A study published this week in the journal Science Advances 
confirms, confirms that matter shifts large CNT membranes perform as well as the small prototypes we've seen so far. This company uh, says that their breakthrough brings down the difficulty and cost of manufacturing the material, which should allow, allow the technology to burst out of the confines of the university labs. It should be possible to combine different types of RCNT membranes in a machine that does what molecular factories have long been predicted to do, to make anything we need from basic molecular building blocks. We're talking about printing matter out of thin air, just like the Federal Reserve does with money. Oh, imagine having one of these devices with you on Mars. Well, wait, you got, you got to first imagine being on Mars, and then you can have one of these things with you. You could print food, fuels, building materials, and medicines from the atmosphere. What about water? Can you print water? <laughs> our soil uh, or, or, or recycled parts um, without having to transport them from Earth. You could print soil. Can you print water? I still, I still need to know that. Anyway, a molecular factory is a long predicted technology that, in theory, should be able to accomplish some of what the replicator from Star Trek does, although not nearly as cleanly as on this show. So you can't just walk up to a device in your wall and say, T, Earl Grey, hot. <laughs> Thanks, John Luke. Anyway, Matter Chef's approach is more about separating the separating and combining molecules to form new raw materials, which is why working on creating fuels is a logical place to start. <laughs> But as McGinnis points out, if it works well, there will be no reason more uh, com that more complex molecular factories can't be combined to become the future of manufacturing. And yes, maybe eventually serve up a drink out of thin air at some point by simply asking a future version of Alexa for T. Earl Grey hot. <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, how about uh, sex pot hot? <laughs> Print me one. <laughs> uh, thank you, Forbes, for that. <laughs> okay, speaking of space and aliens, how about this one? Jews in space. <laughs> I'm not shooting you. <laughs> From the New York Post uh, by James Rogers on January 25th. Israel gears up for a historic mission to the moon. Yep. The exclusive list of countries that have landed spacecraft on the moon could get a new edition this year. This February, now, Israel's Bereshit, Bereshit, whatever, Spacecraft is set to launch from Cape Canaveral uh, Air Force Station atop a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. Bereshit, which is the word Hebrew word for beginning, is expected to land on the lunar surface about two months later. I'm pretty sure this thing's already taken off and is on its way. But I, 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 it's just a lander. There, there's not actually going to be any... Jews in space. Not on this one. <laughs> there may have been Jews in space already. I don't know. I don't keep track of all that. Anyway, the unmanned spacecraft will take Israel into a select group of nations, only three countries, the U.S., the Soviet Union, and China, which have made successful soft landings on the lunar surface. The landing also will be the first private mission to reach Earth's natural satellite. Okay, uh, Bereshit was born out of Google Lunar X Prize competition to land an unmanned probe on the moon. The $30 million competition was scrapped with no winner last year after the organizers said none of the five finalists would make the March 31st, 2018 deadline for the moon launch. Nonetheless, the Israeli team pressed on with development 
of its 397-pound spacecraft. Earlier this month, Bereshit was transported from the Ben Gurion Airport in Israel to Orlando International Airport in Florida and from there to Cape Canaveral. The, the launch from SpaceX Launch Complex 40 SLC or SLC 40, Space Launch Complex 40, SLC 40, yeah, okay, I get it, is targeted for no earlier than mid-February. Like I said, I'm pretty sure this already took off and is on its way. Um, according to the Israeli Space Organization, uh, Space IL, Space Israel, I guess, um, which de- developed the spacecraft with spacecraft, <laughs> spacecraft, spacecraft with Israel Aerospace Industries. After its two-month journey, the probe will land uh, within the Mare Seren... Oh, how do I say this word? Serentadius? I don't know. In the moon's northern hemisphere. Space Ill notes that the, the site has the mag- has magnetic anomalies, enabling Bereshit's magnetometer device to take measurements as part of a scientific experiment. Data from the magnetometer, which was developed with Israel's Wise Man Institutes of Science, will be shared with NASA. Our ultimate aim is to create a profile of the magnetic field of the moon and understand its origin, said Wiseman Institute professor and space ill uh, mission scientist Oded Aronson. Anyway, <laughs> in addition to its science mission, Bereshit will also take a time capsule to the moon consisting of three disks. Uh, the time capsule data includes symbols such as the Israeli flag and the country's national anthem, Hadakava. Ha, ha, and they will also let any aliens that happen to pick up the uh, space capsule that Israel is indeed the rulers of the world. Dictionaries in 27 language, languages are also on the disc, along with the Bible and a children's book inspired by the mission. Bereshit and its time capsule will remain on the lunar surface forever, or until something else picks them up and takes them away. Uh, Bereshit has completed significant a significant milestone on her journey to the moon, arriving safely at Cape Canaveral. Yeah, like I said, I'm pretty sure it's up there and it's on its way and it, it's going, it, it, it's heading there now. So I, I, I don't have an article on that particular thing. But uh, there, there, there is there is the post for you, the link to the post for you in the chat. All these links, by the way, will be in the post show blog, which I will put up to this evening after the show. Uh, I, 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 I already have written it. I just have to grab the audio file and whatever. It'll be up after the show. <laughs> All right. This one may interest you, and I, we may have talked about it in the chat before, but but it's good to get it on audio record and blog blog post record because it's important, I think. It's important that you know this and, and that you embrace the reality of it. New study. Pork fat listed as top 10 most nutritious foods. Now, this morning in the chat, I posted an article from some nutritionist that said that pizza, yes, pizza, is a more nutritious and better breakfast food than cereal. (laughs) So bear in mind, pizza and pork fat, good for you. (laughs) Oh yeah, pork fat is more nutritious than green beans. Oh yeah. In a study published by BBC recently, Pork fat has been crowned the eighth most nutritious food on the planet. It's true. Yes, it's true. (laughs) The words pork fat and nutritious don't quite go together, at least in the uh, common vernacular, the current one. That may soon change, given a surprising finding by scientists, which was first published in 2015, but went viral only recently. According to a BBC report, Researchers who analyzed the more than 1,000 raw foods found that lard is among the top 10 foods which provide the best balance of a person's daily nutritional requirements. Pork fat was ranked 8th on the list of 100 foods 
with a nutritional score of 74. The higher the number, the more likely it will meet your daily nutritional needs. The higher the number, the lower the number. I, 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 th I think they got that backwards. Yeah, anyway, whatever. Uh, meanwhile, uh, there are other items that made it to the top 10, top 10 most nutritious foods. Almonds, chera, cheramoya, I don't know what the hell that is. Ocean perch, flat fish, chia seeds, pumpkin seeds, Swiss chard, pork fat, beet greens, and a snapper. So when you're thinking, you go to the restaurant and you're thinking, oh, I want something that's good for me. Let me get some snapper. No, no, maybe you want bacon. You want a bacon sandwich? Or just pure old, just a pile full of bacon. <laughs> and uh, some of the more popular foods that finished outside of the top 10 this year. Tangerines at 14, peas at 15, chili powder 25. Oh, I love chili powder. Uh, kale at 31, cherries at 47. Oranges at 82. Oranges way down the list, 82. Carrots. 88. Carrots are 88 on the list. Get your vitamin A somewhere else. Sweet potatoes, number 100. And I love sweet potatoes, too. Carrots are fine. I like, I like carrots. Cherries, yes. Delicious. Peas, eh, not so much. Uh, they're okay. Anyway, anyway, so bacon has been redeemed. The key is to eat a balance of highly nutritional foods, like bacon, pork chops, ham, <laughs> Maybe that's not what they mean. Uh, that, that when consumed together, do not contain too much of any one nutrient avoiding uh, to avoid exceeding daily recommended amounts. Uh, those are minimum daily recommended amounts. So those, are, those are not the... Uh, yeah, anyway. Pork fat is a good source of uh, vit B vitamins and minerals. Bacon contains thiamine, vitamin B12, zinc, selenium, which are vital nutrients and, and that the, the body does not naturally produce. You need you need the B12, you need the zinc, you need the selenium. Yeah, you need all that. Thiamine, absolutely. So eat more bacon. Pork fat is also more unsaturated and healthier than lamb or beef fat. The fat fats in bacon are about 50% monounsaturated and a large part of those is oleic acid. Uh, this is the same fatty fatty acid that olive oil is praised for and generally concer considered heart healthy. Heart healthy bacon. I like that. That's a good phrase. Heart healthy bacon. Anyway, uh, then about 40% is saturated fat accompanied by a decent amount of cholesterol, which, you know, that, that's been proven that you, you also need cholesterol. Cholesterol is good for you. Uh, pay no attention to those that say cholesterol is bad for you. Anyway, also, and in case you were unaware of this, in case you maybe don't realize why after eating bacon, you feel good. Bacon is a natural mood enhancer that helps encourage positive mental states. You hearing that? Bacon makes you feel good. It's a mood enhancer. <laughs> it's bacon is surprisingly nutri nutritious and good for mental health. Uh, the health of the brain is vital for the entire body. The brain is the organ that controls the body and ensures everything is functioning appropriately. When problems develop in the brain, it leads to odd behaviors, memory loss, and ultimately death. Bacon can fight off Alzheimer's. <laughs> The choline in bacon is not only useful for the heart, uh, is not only useful for the heart. Choline is a necessary component for the health of the brain. The, the, a diet that contains choline on a regular basis will show reduced rates of memory loss over time. It is used as a treatment for mental impairments, including the Alzheimer's disease and similar dementia type diseases. Studies, I, I need to eat more bacon. That's all there is to it. I, I need to really start chowing down me some bacon. I mean, I eat, I eat bacon, but not not enough to fight off uh, uh, dementia. <laughs> anyway, bear all that in mind when 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 you're when you're when you when you're there 
we, we, and thinking, oh, I'm going to feel guilty because I, I'm eating some bacon. No, 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 no. Feel great because you're eating bacon. Feel like you need a little extra bacon because of that. And yes, it contains some nitrates, but eh, take the good with the bad, man. <laughs> This guy here, this next guy, this next story, he could have used some bacon. to Maybe he would have thought clearer, looked a little closer, paid a little more attention. Instead, what he got was kind of a shitty deal. Ex-convicts stole laxatives thinking they were painkillers. <laughs> From the New York Post. Uh, Natalie Musumiki, I don't know, January 28, 2019. <laughs> this pill three thief crapped out. A Florida ex-convict was busted by cops for stealing over-the-counter laxatives as uh, that he thought were hydrocodone painkillers. Authorities say that Peter Hans Emery, uh, 56, of Pinellas Park, swiped the pills from the victim's lockbox at, at the same home that police listed as Emery's uh, address. Emery Jr.'s relationship with the victim was not immediately clear. According to the criminal complaint by the smoking gun, Emery Jr. was caught on video rummaging through a lockbox, selecting a pill bottle, pouring the pills to, in his hand, and then leaving. The bottle, bottle was labeled hydrocodone acetaminophen, but actually contained equate gentle laxatives, according to the complaint. Uh, the crook admitted to the cops that he took two pills he thought were the opioids, but threw them away when he learned, uh, in a messy way, that they were something else. He also confessed that he did not have permission to take the pills. Emery Jr. is charged with petite theft, has several prior arrests on his record, including charges of burglary, cocaine possession, and grand theft and auto theft. You know, I, I think that it's possible that that maybe you don't really want to charge him with anything because is it, is, wouldn't that be enough? <laughs> wouldn't that be punishment enough? You think you're going gonna, you're gonna to get high and all you do is crap your pants. <laughs> Oh, Florida, what would we ever do without you? <laughs> oh, you got to love Florida. <laughs> Let me get a sip of water here. <clears throat> now, you know, at one point, it was said that eggs, because they contain cholesterol, are bad for you. Yeah, that's a, a poops oops, <laughs> Java. <laughs> anyway, so, but then that was proven wrong, that the cholesterol in eggs is the good cholesterol, the kind you want. And now they got these ones. And, and, and I don't think I really want any of these eggs because there's been so many better ways to deal with the possibility of getting cancer, but they may they may work their way into your food stream and you and you may never know it. But here it is from Disclose TV on January 29th, under their science heading. These genetically modified chickens lay eggs with anti-cancer drugs. Ah, oh, they're so sneaky, getting that getting those drugs into you. Anyway, scientists and researchers have been experimenting with chickens in recent years. You know, that's, that sounds very pervy. Um, it, it may sound odd. Yes, it sounds odd and pervy. But these genetically modified chickens can lay eggs that contain drugs for arthritis and some cancers, too. Can't you just take the drugs for the arthritis and the cancer rather than putting them in the chicken eggs? I, I mean, come on. As everyone knows, cancer drugs are often one of the most expensive treatments on the, on the market. However, this new chick egg production method is 100 times cheaper. Well, I guess that explains it. 
uh, <laughs> than the standard factory production. And why would that be? You still got to feed the, the, or inject, or somehow get those drugs into the chicken. What, what are you, what, what, what are you, what, what are you doing there? All right. Uh, over time, it is believed that this operation could be scaled up to create commercial quantities of these drugs, all while still maintaining the low costs associated with them. Is this animal cruelty? In a statement by Dr. Lisa Heron of Roslyn Technologies in Edinburgh, uh, these genetically modified chickens are pampered compared to regular farm animals. Well, they are now until you are able to gear it up to commercial quantities. Anyway, they live an extremely comfortable life in large pens, being uh, being fed and watered every day. Well, you would hope so. If you want them to produce eggs, they need to be fed and watered every day. Anyway, furthermore, <laughs> they, they are always looked after on a daily basis by trained technicians to ensure their health and well-being. As I said, yeah, but you're, you're, you're looking to scale up to, to create commercial quantities that's not going to be the case once that happens. Uh, the chicken doesn't know any different either, which is another bonus. How do you know the chicken doesn't know any different? Huh? Did you ask the chicken? Did the chicken answer you? <laughs> as far as the animal is concerned, it's just an ordinary, another ordinary chicken chugging away and laying eggs as it would. Its, its health is not affected in any way by this says you. Uh, so what's the science behind all of this? Humans get sick. Yes, that's a fact of life. Most diseases are caused when the body does not naturally produce enough of a certain chemical or protein, which those uh, chemicals and proteins are hampered by other food produced uh, in, in a certain way that you do. And, and other things that you do, like putting fluoride in the water and the chemtrails in the air and all the other nasty crap, all that stuff you put in vaccines. Yeah, that's why your body doesn't produce enough of a certain chemical or protein. Anyway, such diseases can be managed and controlled, if not cured, with drugs that contain the deficient protein. These drugs are synthetically produced by the pharmaceutical companies and scientists in high-tech sterile labs and are usually very expensive to make. To get the chicken eggs to contain certain proteins or drugs, Dr. Heron and her team managed to insert the human gene which is normally involved in producing the protein in question. Well, why don't you just insert that human gene back into the humans? Wouldn't that be more efficient? Uh, uh, anyway, into the part of the chicken's DNA involved with producing the uh, producing the white in the chicken eggs. After cracking the egg and separating the yolk from the white, Dr. Heron found there is quite a large quantity of protein needed. Three eggs ha are enough to produce one dose. Each chicken lays about 300 eggs per year, which is 100 doses. 300 eggs a year, that's uh, not, not that many. That's not even an egg a day. Uh, anyway, which is 100 doses per chicken per year. Hopefully, with enough chickens, we, th this could be commercially viable in the near future. <laughs> yeah, I'm not really thinking that's a great idea. Um, th there are other ways of dealing with uh, get getting those things into humans, if that is really your goal. Grimner, Wiki says there is a Grimner. There is a Grimner. Who the hell do you think I am? <laughs> All right, so there you go on your GM chickens. <laughs> All right. Oh, I thought I had another alien story. No more alien stories. Okay. But here's a story coming from the independent.co.uk that Seemed a little surprising to me to be coming off of one of these clap outlets. But here it is. Uh, by Ian Hamilton on January 31st. People, you, I, others, people take drugs for pleasure and fun. So why do we drown that out by obsessing over the harm? Well, we, if you mean my, myself, 
and others that I know, we don't drown that out by obsessing over the harm. Matter of fact, more often than not, those of us that partake in the herb tend to emphasize the opposite. Not the harm, but the benefit, the goodness that is done using whatever you want to call it, marijuana, weed, cannabis. Pick your own name. Anyway, it says we have been rather snooty about ignoring the wisdom of cultures that have found the benefit to drugs that go beyond ritual. Are you one of the 10 million, I think that's a low number, people who have used drugs like cannabis or cocaine? 10 million? That's that's a way low number. 10 million, we're, maybe that's in the UK. Maybe those are UK numbers, 10 million. Anyway, make no mistake, drugs are fun. Woohoo! <laughs> they must be given, they must be given the scale of drug use and the long history we humans have of using them. Yes, indeed, drugs are fun. Or they can be, uh, depending on what you're taking and, 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 and your uh, mental state at the time. Despite the upside of using drugs, it's not an aspect that's given the attention it deserves. It's a bit like the way no one seems interested in a good news story. Instead, when drugs are featured in the clap, it's usually it's usually to panic about the latest incarnation of some new pill or powder that there's fear of becoming addicted. But in truth, this is the rare this is rare in our understanding of how this happens and who is at risk is still being unraveled. Cannabis research suggests that the majority of people using it won't become addicted because it's not an addictive substance. It's not an addicting substance. It may become habitual, but that's not addiction. That's a habit. Even if they use it frequently, unlike tobacco where eight out of 10 people who start using it become dependent. Yes, indeed. The distortion, quit moving around on me, Paige. The distortion of the drug experience we are actually exposed to matters. And in any case, it doesn't deter millions giving a drugs a go. Many people won't recognize the information they have been fed about drugs, given the mostly positive experience they will have. So which drugs are we using for pleasure? Uh, difference differs for different people. Yeah. It's no surprise that cannabis continues to be numero uno with the illicit drug. <laughs> Pop, popular illicit. What's so illicit? What is so illicit? I'm not quite done there yet. Sock, I know my time's over, but I'm, I'm still finishing up here. <laughs> oh, I'll let you read the rest of this for yourself, but bear in mind that Drugs are fun. Yeah. Yeah, they are. You can have a good time doing some drugs. Yes, indeedy. But I got another story for you. Well, I don't need to give you the story. I, I, we've already talked about it here in the chat. I'll give you the title because that's really all you need. Uh, and, and, and you all know, even before this article ever came out, which was January 16th, you've known for years, most of you probably, that this is what's going on. Uh, Google, Google, the big evil corporation, Google, manipulated YouTube search results to program users' behavior. They want to program your behavior. Yes, they do. So, uh, here, here, did I give you that link? Let me give you that link. All right. Activist post on Max Slavo, um, January 16th. I think I already mentioned that. So, uh, there it is. Yep. Google. Evil Google. What's going on there with the flute bot not giving me my titles? I don't know. Title not found. Oh, okay. I get it. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for tuning in here to uh, the uh, Grim Leftovers program. And I, I know those eggs got you a little excited there. 
<laughs> Y'all went off on a little calculation of how many eggs per year. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> I'll be back again next Monday with some more of this stuff. Assuming I still have stories lined up, and I'm sure that I will. I still got 80 in the list, uh, which means if I get to, what, 10 during Freakers or 12, maybe, then I'll be back here to do another eight or so sh stories for you then. But tomorrow is uh, Flash Somebody in a perfect world. We'll see if Vinny shows up or not. I don't know. Uh, then on Wednesday, you got Graham's at uh, 7 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday and Friday at Grammy's Rocket Chair. And on Thursday, you got Flash once again and 20% off at 6 p.m. Eastern. Um, again, we'll see about Vinny on Friday. I, I don't I don't, I don't, don't think he'll be doing a show, but we, we, we don't know. Uh, if he does, it'll be at 1 p.m. Eastern, and it's called Upon the Gander. Either way, myself and the Moose Girl will be on Friday night at 11 p.m. Eastern. Doing the Freakers Ball, having a great old time, fun, fun, fun. And then Saturday is Flash once again, <coughs> excuse me, with his show, The Dark Table. Sunday, Blues, Trivia, Noon Eastern, right here, RLM Radio. Yes, indeed. Uh, so don't miss that. Three hours of Blues and Trivia. It's awesome stuff. It's fun. Followed by Hal Anthony behind the woodshed, opening up the big old can of whoop ass. All right, y'all have a great rest of your evening, a good week, and we'll talk to you next time. Peace.